Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians, you all are welcome to the third session of the Peer Learning Periphery to the Four online case discussion by physicians away from the center. My name is Dr. Rohit Amaravitarna, the moderator of the today event. We know that the physicians working in outstations with limited resources have evolved excellent clinical skills in patient management. So there is a lot to be learned from them. Peer learning periphery to the fore is a platform for the physicians who work away from the center to share their knowledge and experiences with others. In this session, two physicians present and discuss clinical cases in one hour period. Today, we have two consultants from District Hospital Monragal and Nephrology Specialized Hospital Polar Narua. At the end of the both presentations, we will discuss the questions. Please send your questions to Q&A box. Let me to introduce the first speaker today, Dr. Malin Utpala Dahanayak, Consultant General Physician, District General Hospital, Monragala. Dr. Malin Utpala Dahanayak, MBBS Ruhuna, MTA Colombo, completed overseas training at McKay Base Hospital in Queensland, Australia. He served in many hospitals in Sri Lanka as a consultant general physician, including TH Karapitya, BH Baticolo, and uh, BH Balapitya. He is going to talk on a rare presentation of a rare disease. Over to you, Dr. Malin. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for kind words of introduction. First of all, I would like to thank Ceylon College of Physicians and organizers for giving me this opportunity. Over the next 10, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, I'm going to discuss about a uh, very rare disease presented with a uh, very unusual manner. Moving on to my topic, my patient is Mr. A, is a 48 year old farmer from Monaragala. He's a father of two children presented with right side chest anterolateral diffuse firm and non-tender swelling over the period of two years. You all can appreciate the lesion and the size, how extended is, is it. It has a very smooth margin and almost is spread over the anterior and lateral aspect of the chest, luckily spread over one side. Except this massive lesion, he doesn't have no any other significant past medical history. Lesion is gradually increased over the period and extended anterior and posterior chest wall and just is spread over the uh, aspect of the chest. It looks like wearing a body arm. Lesion causes unremarkable disfiguration but patient denies any itching over the lesion. He experienced significant limitation of chest movements over the period and developed pain while chest wall movements. Dear ladies and gentlemen, this pain might be due to this woody hard lesion. History of insect bites over the right axillary region, but no suggestive trauma or uh, thrown pick. No tenderness over lesion. He experienced on and off fever from the beginning of lesion and worsening symptoms over six weeks. He experienced chills with rigors and evening pyrexia. He experienced with the loss of appetite and remarkable loss of weight over nearly 10 kilograms over last few months. He undergone incision and drain at private sector for several times over the period, and he feels it caused more spread. On examination, 
unless this huge lesion he does not uh, appreciate or we couldn't appreciate any other abnormality on general examination uh, except this lesion perfectly normal no peripheral lymphadenopathy on systemic respiratory cardiovascular abdomen and cns examination were unremarkable with this history and examination findings we refer this patient to consultant dermatologist as well as consultant rheumatologist we came to a differential diagnosis possibility of subcutaneous panniculitis like t cell lymphoma or maybe a morphia profundus or maybe a subcutaneous infection or infestation probably due to fungal or parasitic or maybe a systemic disease like sarcoidosis can present in any any manner or tuberculosis or lymphoma so before this patient presented to us invest, investigated at the teaching hospital and uh, provincial general hospital for last two years he has undergone two cut biopsy at both places provincial general hospital two cut biopsy they pick shows possibility of chronic abscess foreign body reaction with granuloma formation teaching hospital true cut biopsy mention as no langerhans site giant cells no caseous necrosis no fungal hype no vasculitis or panniculitis there is no evidence of dysplasia or malignancy both through a biopsy histology concluded as foreign body giant cell reaction query tuberculosis he has undergone several imaging as well ultrasound chest initial one mention as possibility of cellulitis fluid tracking along the tissue planes in right side anterior lateral chest wall no drainable collection contrast chest shows subcutaneous edema with a small collection in relation to right posterior wall of chest mri chest shows features are in favor of right side chest wall soft tissue edema involves adjacent right serratus anterior and latissimus dorsi muscles with focal area of subacute hematoma and necros necrotic area he has undergone a extensive tb studies including man 2 chest x ray and tb pcr from true cut biopsy all were negative however he has undergone trial of anti tb medication even for one month duration without any promising result patient is stay with us nearly one uh, one month duration from 17th of december to 17th of january during that period we monitored his fever pattern and found to have high fever spikes but we couldn't appreciate or related with any medication at the very beginning we started empirical antibiotics started with ocmentin then metronidazole then go ahead with the doxycycline and at one stage we got a positive urine culture for coliform but patient denies any symptom except the fever however we started meropenem it was sensitive for meropenem but fever doesn't improve with that medication in here you all can see no fever after 9th or 10th we started definitive treatment somewhere there other basic investigations over the period of hospital stay so patient presented to us with a full blood count and uh, it shows uh, hemoglobin around 12.3 over the stay in the hospital it gradually uh, coming down and go down up to a 8.8 wbc count throughout is slightly elevated and there is 
slightly increase eosinophil count over the period. Also, possible reactive thrombocytosis also observed. His CRP throughout persists uh, above 50, and one stage is go up to 142. ESR persistently high, and serum ferritin like uh, inflammatory markers is is around 1469. LDH and ACE level were within normal range. His renal functions pers throughout persists within normal range. As I mentioned above, he doesn't have any comorbidities. His random blood sugar was 75. Urine full report was normal, electrolyte uh, within normal range, and urine culture once came positive for coliform, blood culture were negative, and calcium towards just towards uh, low side. So liver functions and biochemistry, we observed elevated uh, transaminases and ALT more than AST and reverse albumin globulin ratio from the beginning. Other than that, bilirubin and INR within normal range. So we plan to repeat through cut biopsy from suspicious limb node and the lesion, from the lesion. Meanwhile, we started symptomatic treatment, as I mentioned, with empirical antibiotics, pain relief, and antipyretics. Once urine culture came as positive for coliform, we treated with meropen. Over the period, as I mentioned, we observed elevated ASTLT, maybe due to antibiotic, including doxycycline. He has undergone a trans thoracic and trans esophageal echocardiogram, and result came as normal. His blood picture shows moderate eosinophilia, and uh, screening for HIV and VDRL was negative. Repeat ultrasound scan at District General Hospital in Monaragra shows diffuse soft tissue and subcutaneous edema involving underlying muscles. No focal mass or collection. Right side borderline axillary limb node noted. At last, we got the histology. Uh, it shows uh, subcutaneous tissue as well as epidermis and the dermis, and it mentioned about epidermis and dermis appear unremarkable. Granuloma shows central eosinophilic material with karyotic debris, scattered neutrophils, and surrounded by palisades of epithelioid histiocytes. Occasional multinucleated giant cells. Some of the granulomas show broad fungal hyphae with occasional septations. There are no confluent granulomas with central caseous type necrosis. Lymphoid tissue is not included. Even though we thought it's a lymph node, probably it's an active uh, lesion. So HNE stain shows the epithelial granuloma with fungal hyphae in the center. This would be the fungal hyphae. <clears throat> Next slide shows broad aseptate fungal, fungal hype with associated multinucleated giant cells and epithelioid histiocytes. This is the fungal hype, the aseptate. So broad aseptate hype is surrounded by bright eosinophilic material with background of dense eosinophilic infiltrate. It's called splendor hopley phenomena. So fungal hype and eosinophilic infiltration. This can easily mimic as a blood vessel and surrounding eosinophilic material 
it is a very common finding in vasculitis. So just because due to this fungus is uh, aseptate, very difficult to recognize. Conclusion of histology, subcutaneous fibroadipose tissue with suppurative granulomatous inflammation caused by broad aseptic fungus. Suggest as stain, silver stain and culture for confirmation. So we make sure to send a fresh true cut biopsy sample for staining and fungal culture. Meanwhile, we start a definitive treatment with itraconazole 200 milligram twice daily. We contacted the uh, mycologist at the uh, Medical Research Institute at Colombo, and she advised to continue itraconazole two months after complete disappearance of lesion. We follow up with transaminases and other liver functions. Meanwhile, we got the fungal culture reports. So you all can see creamy white color, colonies, and under the microscope, filamentous fungus. The, fu the fungal culture on Dextrose agar at 30 centigrade after 10 days of incubation showed creamy white heaped up furrowed colonies, which identified the fungus as Basidiobolus panorum. Silver stain and culture studies came as positive for fungal studies. A case of Basidiobolomycosis diagnosed based on clinical features histopathology and culture findings. Patient very well respond to treatment and lesion start to shrink within few weeks. ASTLT came to baseline within few weeks after cessation of empirical antibiotics, even with continuation of itraconazole. Albumin globulin ratio became normal after four months of treatment with near complete resolution of lesion. After four months of treatment, now, you all can even very difficult to appreciate any underlying lesion. Basidio bolus phenomenon is entopomycosis in humans caused by Basidio bolus phenomenon was first described in Indonesia in 1956. Basidio bolus is a sporotic fungus present in soil decaying fruit and vegetable matter and the gut of amphibians and reptiles, bats and fish. The mode of infection is exactly not known, but it is assumed that transmission may occur by implantation of spores of the organism via minor trauma, such as insect bite, possible cause for our patient as well, thrown peak, or minor laceration or by inhalation of spores, which often goes unnoticed. It can cause a variety of clinical manifestations, including subcutaneous psychomycosis, like our patient, gastrointestinal psychomycosis, and occasionally an acute systemic illness. Dear ladies and gentlemen, this condition is common with subcutaneous psychomycosis, but most of the cases presented with extremities or thigh or perineal region. Very unusual to present with the chest. And also it can cause uh, intestinal obstruction due to gastrointestinal psychomycosis. Although the organism is found worldwide, the disease is prevalent in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. Few cases of basidiobolomycosis have been reported from Sri Lanka The disease usually occurs in children, less often in adolescents and rarely in adults. Males are much more frequently affected than females. 
present as a painless subcutaneous swelling, usually in young age. It is usually seen in the native of Asia, Africa, and South America. Histological features are present of broad, thin wall, infrequently septate, hypae fragments, developed by eosinophily, splendid or hoppy material. Demonstration of the aseptate fungal hypae on histopathology and confirmation by culture clinched the diagnosis. Treatment with potassium iodide and azole is the gold standard. Approximately 6 to 12 months of treatment is usually needed with itraconazole. In the present case also, the patient responds very well to itraconazole and the swelling resolved after four months of treatment. The role of surgical resection is controversial. My take home message. Our case highlights the importance of high index of suspicion required to diagnose the condition basidiobolomycosis early when immune competent patient present with unusual painless subcutaneous lesion. Early diagnosis prevent unnecessary surgical intervention, disfigurement produced by advanced disease and unnecessary psychological trauma to the patient. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my presentation may not be completed unless thanks my hardworking colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. M.K.L. Manjula, consultant histopathologist, District General Hospital, Monaragala, unless his tireless work and enthusiasm towards this case, we may not be able to come to the diagnosis. He himself contacted several histopathologists and uh, parasitology departments and looked for his training and culture. Then Dr. Primali Jayasekar, consultant medical mycologist, head department of mycology, Medical Research Institute, Colombo. Thank you, madam, for your uh, great help and given us a definitive diagnosis. Also, my colleague, Dr. Janani Lianage, consultant dermatologist, District General Hospital, Monaragala. She has very high enthusiasm from the beginning of this uh, case and currently she is follow up, followed up this patient at her clinic. And also my colleague, Dr. Akalanga Pereira, consultant surgeon, District General Hospital, Monaragala, uh, doing um, uh, biopsy as a first case in the day for two times. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malin, for a very interesting and very informative presentation. Uh, it's a very rare case. Uh, I think we learned a lot from your case presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Malin. And uh, we will discuss uh, questions at the end of the next presentation. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Maitri Fernando, consultant nephrologist. Nephrology Specialized Hospital, Polonal. Dr. Maitri Fernando, MBBS, MD, overseas training at Royal Free Hospital London, NHS Foundation Trust UK. Earlier, he uh, served as a consultant nephrologist at uh, BH Medical. He is going to present on not the usual pulmonary renal syndrome. Over to you, Dr. Maitri. Hello. Yeah, good evening to everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, so we'll uh, talk about uh, this uh, quite interesting uh, patient uh, that uh, I came across. Right. Uh, okay. Just a second. Yeah, so this was a previously healthy 16 uh, year old girl who presented with uh, reduced urine output, uh, facial puffiness and uh, bilateral lower limb swelling. And uh, so she was a previously healthy person and uh, she had a history of uh, chicken pox that was about two weeks back. And uh, some of the lesions had got secondarily infected. <coughs> and there was a, uh, almost a halfly healing ulcer in her foot. 
and uh, she presented with this uh, reduced urine output uh, over around five days over limb swelling. And she also complained of a mild headache. Uh, she actually was uh, referred to us from a general practitioner who had noted that she was having raised serum creatinine. Uh, so at uh, presentation uh, on examination, uh, she had a facial puffiness and her blood pressure was quite raised actually, 180 by 100. Uh, and her fundi showed grade two hypertensive changes with uh, silver wiring. And uh, she was having this healing left foot ulcer. So since the BP was high and the renal functions were raised, uh, we examined for a renal brewery, uh, which uh, we couldn't find none. And there were no any cardiac murmurs. And uh, we were also looking for any features of peripheral uh, features of vasculitis. So there were no any palpable purpura. Uh, and uh, there were no any other features of like any hearing loss, nasal crusting, uh, which all indicates uh, things like uh, this uh, granulomatosis, polyangiitis, uh, previously called vaginess, so which can present in this kind of a uh, presentation. And uh, she also did not have any features of any scleroderma or any peripheral features of uh, systemic lupus. Uh, so her labs were like uh, on presentation to us, uh, the creatinine was 563, uh, which was quite raised. And uh, her urea was also raised. And uh, we noted that uh, she had this uh, active urine sediment. So where there was uh, protein uh, three plus uh, with uh, red cells, uh, two plus and 80% uh, of these red cells uh, were dysmorphic uh, RBCs, right? So this was very significant. So this indicates active urine sediment uh, that in indicates that uh, there is glomerulonephritis in this patient, right? And uh, her urine PCR was 4.5. So any PCR of more than 3.5 is called uh, an nephrotic range PCR, right? And the serum albumin also also 21, so which is uh, again uh, dramatically reduced. And uh, obviously her ASOT as expected was 400, right? So, uh, and her ultrasound that we did uh, showed a right side pleural effusion and uh, her kidneys were basically normal, right? There were no any features of CKD and uh, there were well-preserved kidneys, normal sizes, and her cortical metal demarcation was preserved. So basically she was having an AKI, right? So given the history of a secondary infected ulcer and uh, this presentation with low volume swelling with an active urine sediment and uh, an aphrotic range protein urea with low albumin and a raised ASOT, so our diagnosis was obviously acute glomerular nephritis, right? Uh, so we were basically happy, like, uh, so she's going to have this AGN and she's going to resolve and go home. But uh, there was something bit, uh, kind of funny on this presentation. That is, uh, in acute glomerulonephritis, we usually don't see um, this much of a raised serum creatinine, uh, which was around 500. But uh, sometimes we do see uh, a raised creatinine, uh, but uh, we see that it uh, typically like kind of comes down by itself very rapidly. But in her case, on by day A, uh, she developed oliguria right? And she developed shortness of breath, right? And on examination, she had uh, creps up to her apexes, right? And her saturation was also coming kind of dropping, right? And uh, the repeat creatinine, uh, which was 920, which we never expected in a case of AGA, right? Now, uh, I mean, there was no other option, like uh, we had to save her life, right? So we had to immediately start on acute dialysis, right? Uh, through internal jugular vascular. Uh, so at this moment, uh, we still were with the diagnosis of post-infectious uh, AGN, uh, but in a kind of a rare presentation, uh, which we had to start dialysis. So in AGN, starting dialysis is a very, I mean, it's it a kind of very rare thing that we have cases, case reports are there, which we had to start dialysis, but uh, which is uh, kind of very unusual, right? Uh, so, uh, but we had to start dialysis on that, right? Right, so then uh, uh, around the, but, and we couldn't get her off dialysis. Usually in AGN, uh, like we give one or two dialysis and uh, she kind of should improve, right? Uh, but uh, like she was dependent on dialysis for more than 10 days, right? So we were thinking like there may be something else going on, right? So, I mean, uh, we took the opportunity to do a native renal biopsy, 
right? And her latest lab reports uh, were showing a dramatic drop in her hemoglobin. It is now 5.8 with a platelet count of 85,000. <clears> and uh, the blood film uh, showed a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with uh, fragment red, red cells and uh, low platelet count. And uh, so we did the LDH. So since there was Maha, and LDH was uh, about 1,000. So this is 3,400. So that is uh, very significantly raised. So now our working diagnosis was a thrombotic microangiopathy causing this uh, AKI in this patient because uh, she's having a Maha uh, with a low platelet and uh, hemolysis features are there with a raised LDH, right? So uh, usually we think of uh, like common conditions of uh, thrombotic microangiopathy in this kind of case, like TTP, right? So uh, we thought of uh, such a diagnosis and we started uh, emergency uh, therapeutic plasma exchange. <clears throat> so with the uh, TP, the plasma exchange, uh, she dramatically improved. Her urine output improved. Uh, so we could uh, get her off dialysis and her creatinine normalized and the platelet count improved to 320 from that 80,000, right? Uh, so as usual, since the platelet is now about 150,000, uh, on two consecutive days, uh, we stopped the TP plasma exchange, right? So we thought now we have a kind of right treated this patient. But uh, for our surprise, after stopping the plasma exchange, uh, on the fifth day of stopping plasma exchange, uh, she again uh, started dropping her hemoglobin. Uh, we had to give some blood transfusions in the interim. So her HB again dropped to 7.8. A platelet from the 320 now again dropped to 9,000. So, and she developed high grade fever. Now she was breathless. And uh, the chest x ray was showing uh, fluffy shadows in both the lung fields. Uh, but a CRP was remaining normal, right? And uh, at this moment, like our clinical diagnosis was that uh, she had been in hospital for more than two weeks. So, we were thinking that she's having a hospital acquired pneumonia, right? So, with the microbiology uh, involvement, we started on PIPTAS and Ticopanin to cover a hospital acquired bug, right? And uh, hoping that she'll improve from this. But uh, despite adequate antibiotic, uh, her respiratory function did She basically developed massive pulmonary hemorrhage. Like uh, her saturation drops to around 80s. So, and uh, she was uh, seriously dyslexic. And uh, so we had to immediately intubate her. And uh, we had, sent to, had to send her to the ICU for ventilation. And, uh, and uh, while sending to the ICU, she developed uh, three uh, generalized tonic chronic seizures. And, uh, and at that time, uh, she was already into bed and on the ventilator. And uh, so these were not hypoxic seizures, right? Uh, so she had a respiratory failure with the pulmonary hemorrhage. Now she's developing seizures. So we thought like, I mean, uh, there's no point. I mean, we may not be able to save, right? So now uh, the renal biopsy results uh, finally came. Over here, you can see the the mesangial hypercellularity over there, right? Uh, three plus of mesangial hypercellularity. And uh, she also had uh, this uh, immunofluorescent staining. Uh, there was uh, two plus of uh, C3 deposition in the immunofluorescence, right? So that was keeping with the diagnosis of AGN, right? But uh, she had some extra features other than this AGN. Uh, we saw that there is this uh, fibrinoid necrosis of the small arteries. Uh, with extravasated fibrinoid material. And also we noted that uh, she had this, uh, uh, the glomerular were showing hypoxic changes. So which are unusual in a patient with acute glomerular nephritis, right? So, uh, but uh, since the diagnosis, they mentioned that this is possibly a vasculitis. Uh, and uh, now the patient is also having pulmonary hemorrhage, right? And uh, there's an AKI going on with glomerular involvement. Uh, we obviously thought this is a rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. So that's uh, what I've been told right, in the MD and everything. So if a patient has AKI with uh, pulmonary hemorrhage and with the UFR showing a glomerular sediment, receive glomerular, the biopsy was also in that possible vasculitis in the comment, right? So then uh, what we did was, uh, so we had to, uh, as in any case of uh, RPGN, we had to go for a, uh, we had to first explore 
infective endocarditis because infective endocarditis and uh, and we said he was doing as well and uh, we started on ivo iv cycle possible and uh, at this time because she was having pulmonary hemorrhagic plasma exchange for the pulmonary hemorrhages with the respiratory support right and uh, so with the plasma exchanges and all the other treatment uh, she was kind of improving but uh, we were not very happy with that diagnosis of this uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis because this maha that uh, was there from the initial stages was persisting so the maha was persisting and the ldh was remaining high 2009 it was not going down right so we were a bit uh, like kind of not very happy with this uh, rpg and diagnosis so we actually reexamined this renal biopsy so with our uh, other colleagues and the pathologists we went through the biopsy again right and uh, the main feature we were seeing was this maha right with a very high ldh right so when we again reexamined the biopsy Uh, we could get to the diagnosis of a thrombotic mitroangiopathy because uh, as i mentioned earlier there was a glomerular uh, hyperperfusion features which is a classical feature of maha in the kidney right and this fibrinoid necrosis was actually not because of a vasculitis it was be because of the thrombotic mitroangiopathy so so when we reviewed many pathology uh, biopsies uh, this was a very common finding actually so initially though we thought this is a vasculitis it turned out to be a thrombotic microangiopathy right so uh, so at this moment uh, well, this is what we have now uh, so she, her renal biopsy is showing this fibrinocrosis right uh, which is a feature of tma thrombotic microangiopathy and uh, at this juncture she was having multi system involvement right so she was having renal failure aki uh, maha pulmonary hemorrhages and the generalized tonic clonic seizures and the biopsy also now when we reexamined it it is showing a thrombotic microangiopathy right so now we had to go through the differential diagnosis of tma in this patient right so so what are the features uh, what are the dd of tma right so the, the common uh, causes of tma are first is scleroderma right but uh, she was not having any features of scleroderma right there was no any skin thickening and another common presentation of uh, tma is caps caps is a catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome right so this is a real possibility because caps present with multi system involvement right so caps has pulmonary hemorrhages it can it has aki right it has seizures with low gcs right and it has heart failure right so this is possible right but uh, dic is another uh, cause of tma but uh, dic was unlikely because her clotting profile was normal her uh, ptinr and aptt were all normal right and uh, the ttp thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura is again possible but this uh, classical multi system involvement with pulmonary hemorrhages uh, it is not very common in ttp we usually get cn his involvement with low gcs seizures and some renal involvement but uh, pulmonary hemorrhages are not very common with ttp right and uh, another cause of tma is malignant hypertension but in this patient uh, though she was hypertensive in the beginning uh, we controlled her blood pressure with antihypertensives now the bp was kind of controlled 140 by 95 but the maha was persisting and the fundi was only showing grade 3 hypertensive changes right so this was again kind of unlikely high malignant hypertension causing this picture right and uh, the sixth possibility is the uh, complement mediated tma this was previously called as atypical hemolytic ileomic syndrome right so this is again possible but actually speaking with this classic multi system involvement only two of these differentials uh, we should think about so that is the caps catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome and the uh, complement mediated tma that is the atypical hus we all know about right so uh, so we had to revise some diagnosis now right so now uh, other thing we noted was her c3 levels which was again a feature of agn again we have low c3 right uh, so the, but her c3 uh, was persisting low beyond 3 months so in agn we usually see the c3 normalizing after 3 months right but her case the c3 was persistently uh, at a lower level it never recovered 
right? And she had this multi-organ involvement. So with a low C3 and multi-organ involvement and the uh, maha with the thrombotic microangiopathy, as I mentioned earlier, there are only two diagnoses that we should think of. So one is the catastrophic antiphospholipid and the other one is the atypical HUS. But in her presentation, we never had any features of thrombotic events because uh, caps usually will have some large vessel thrombotic event, either venous thrombosis or arterial thrombosis. But she never had any thrombotic event. Any large vessel thrombosis was not there. Though there was a micro level thrombosis in the capillary level, but there was no any large vessel thrombosis, right? And uh, she, and also we sent the, this lupus anticoagulant and the IgG uh, for the cardiolipin antibody, uh, which were, came like very late actually, but they came as negative, right? So we could exclude this uh, caps as the uh, other differential, right? So, and we are left with this uh, CMTMA, that is the atypical HUS. So actually our patient was suffering from uh, this atypical HUS, which has actually got triggered due to that skin, skin, skin sepsis, which is like the actually usually what is that, that's what happens. Uh, they have a, a hereditary predisposition for the uh, HUS, and whenever they get an infection, the complement system kind of gets activated. And since they are lacking these inhibitors for the complement system, the system keeps on getting activated. And that is the triggering event of this uh, pressure, the skin sepsis. Right, so now uh, with the plasma exchange, uh, our patient's renal functions dramatically improve and we could get her off dialysis and uh, her lung functions, the pulmonary hemorrhage, everything settled and we were able to extubate the patient. Uh, and actually speaking, she had a record 55 sessions of plasma exchange. So I think this may be a record for Sri Lanka, right? 55 sessions of plasma. This span out to more than one year of plasma exchanges for this lady, right? I mean, uh, we never heard of this, right? And, uh, and we had to actually create an AVF, uh, atrovenous fistula, for the plasma exchanges because we couldn't keep a temporary line or a perm line for more than one year, right? So we had, a, we had to create an AVF to do the plasma exchange. And uh, so with the plasma exchange, initially we did very regular plasma exchanges. And later on, we were able to phase out the plasma exchange and finally stop it. Uh, so after stopping the plasma exchange, again, we were very cautious because uh, this disease could rebound, right? So we uh, carefully monitored the platelets, the LDH and the blood picture and the renal functions. So luckily the disease hasn't yet uh, rebounded. And actually she continued to do very well. And uh, she's now a nursing officer, right? Uh, I mean, so we are very happy. We are in very close contact with this patient at the moment is actually, I told her to join to this presentation also she may be a participant, right? Uh, right, so now uh, thinking of this uh, atypical HUS, uh, we have to remember is usually the inherited varieties are never, uh, they never improve, right? Because uh, there's an inherited uh, mutation of these uh, genes that regulate the uh, complement activation. And once it is uh, triggered and uh, the cascade starts, you cannot never go back, right? So they need lifelong, uh, some kind of anti-platelet therapy, uh, anti-complement therapy to preserve the life, right? But as this patient, uh, I mean, spontaneously improved, though it start, happened like after about almost one year, uh, it is very likely that she had developed antibody for the complement factor H, right? So this scenario where this antibody to the complement factor H, uh, in this case, we see a spontaneous recovery, right? So uh, we assume that uh, she, she would have uh, had this antibody, not the inherited form, right? Uh, so a little bit about the, this uh, atypical HUS or the complement mediated TMA. Uh, so this is basically a, a thing that is due to the, uh, I mean, like unregulated activation of the complement system, right? So, uh, so our complement system uh, is basically, that is there for the immune surveillance, right? So the complement system is usually in a state of uh, low level activity at all times, right? So it's at a low level activity, but there are regulatory proteins, right? Which are acting like inhibitors which are keeping, keeping this low level activity in a control level, right? So it doesn't let it uh, go overboard, right? So what happens in uh, these patients, uh, they have a lack of uh, these complement inhibitory proteins, 
right? So the common proteins that they are lacking are the complement factor H, the complement factor I, and the membrane cofactor protein, right? So these three proteins are very important regulatory proteins which inhibit the complement system from getting activated, right? So, uh, so what happens in these uh, atypical HUS patients are that they have an inherited mutation that codes for these three genes, right? So then uh, the production of these inhibitors are deficient in our patients, right? So whenever they are presented with an insult where the complement system activates, the activation goes on unchecked, right? Leading to tissue damage, right? Uh, so that is one mechanism. The other mechanism is the formation of an antibody, right? Uh, so that is actually a better one, actually. The antibody, because it is a transient thing. It, uh, it has a recoverable chance, right? But not the inherited varieties, right? Okay, so uh, I thought of like just talking about like uh, in your like day-to-day -day practice, uh, you come up with this AKI, right? Very commonly we have acute kidney injury in our wards, right? So whenever you see a patient with AKI and thrombocytopenia, right? So what are the things you have to uh, think of, right? So whenever you see AKI and thrombocytopenia, always remember first leptospirosis, right? So this is a very common uh, like a case where you see AKI with thrombocytopenia, right? And uh, so the history may be there or may not be there, right? So that is one thing. And the other thing is the, the TMAs, right? Thrombotic microangiopathies. Then the SLE nephritis. Uh, lupus can present with uh, first time with uh, AKI with low thrombocytopenia, especially in the females. Right? We commonly see it in females, but males also can present. And also we have to think of hepatorenal syndrome, right? So whenever you are dealing with the AKI with a thrombocytopenia, always remember to ask for a blood picture, right? So this is very important, right? So don't assume that this is a leptospirosis and just leave it, right? Just always ask for a blood picture. This blood picture will be very helpful because in a leptospirosis, you can see that there are toxic uh, granules in your neutrophils, right? There will be features of acute bacterial sepsis, right? So that is uh, that you will be keeping in fear of leptospirosis. But uh, if your blood picture shows a maha, right? Where there is uh, fragmented red cells with the low platelet, right? then you have to think of uh, uh, this uh, TMA, thrombotic microangiopathy, right? So, so always remember to ask for a blood picture and an LDH, right? Again, a marker of hemolysis uh, in a patient with AKI with thrombocytopenia. So actually, uh, I, at the end, I will show another slide, uh, renal biopsy, which actually happened in uh, TH Candy very recently. Uh, this patient uh, came as, uh, they treated him, him as a leptospirosis, right? Uh, because uh, they have a thrombocytopenia and AKI, right? Uh, and, uh, and finally, it, it again was a atypical HUS, right? Uh, later on, they only came to the diagnosis, right? So management of uh, TMA, uh, so this is what we do actually in everywhere in the country, but with our limited resource, right? Uh, so basically, you have to hydrate the patient, avoid any nephrotoxics, right? And if the HP is low, you can transfuse the patient. And uh, if the platelet is less than 50,000 and you have to, let's say, put a VASCAT for dialysis, yeah, you have to give a platelet, right? There's no other, other question about it, right? You don't want to bleed the platelet to death, right? So you give platelet and put the line, but if you are not uh, having any bleeding or not going to do any intervention, then there's no need of any platelet transfusion, right? Unless the patient is bleeding significantly, right? So, and uh, then the renal replacement therapy, according to the standard indication, there's no any special indications for this. And you have to always start the therapeutic plasma exchange as soon as possible. So this is very important, right? So if you detect the MAHA and the TMA in the evening, you start your T TPE in the evening, right? You don't do it in the morning, right? So we have had patients who had died in the night, right? Delaying the plasma exchange. Always remember this, right? You have to start it as soon as possible, right? If you have the transmission physician and the machine is available, you start it in the night, right? Don't keep it in the morning, right? Okay, so and uh, another thing to remember is uh, before starting, uh, if you have the facility, you send the C3 level and the Adam TS13 levels because once you start plasma exchange, these values can go reduce because you are plasma exchanging, right? So then uh, the, the, you, it will interfere with your uh, I mean, diagnosis. The C3 levels will drop with plasma exchange because it's a protein, right? It gets depleted with the plasma exchange. 
And the ADAM TS30, let's say this is a patient with the TTP, thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura, uh, will end up, because the plasma exchange, we are giving for FFP, right? So the FFP will be giving the patient ADAM TS30, right? So your, when you look at the level after plasma exchange, you may see a normal uh, ADAM TS30 level, right? So that will uh, kind of like, uh, I mean, kind of mess up your diagnosis, right? So before plasma exchange, always remember, send the C3 and the ADAM TS13 if that is available to you, right? And uh, yeah, so what we do is after doing that, we continue the plasma exchange, right? And uh, we usually continue for five plasma exchanges, right? Uh, and if you have the ADAM TS13, you have to send that till the levels become normal, right? And after the five plasma exchanges and the once the platelet is above 150,000, you may gradually stop the plasma exchange. But do continue to monitor the plasma, the platelet count, the blood picture, and the LDH and the renal functions. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, so that is how we basically approach the management, right? Uh, but in our patient, since this patient, uh, I mean, was dependent on plasma exchanges, and, uh, and the other thing that the patient's C3 level was persistently low, uh, this patient was having this atypical HUS. This was not TTP, right? Because TTP, you don't see a low C3 level. So that is one differentiating uh, thing that you can use in your clinical practice. In atypical HUS, the C3 level will be low. Because why it is low? Because there is a continuous activation of the alternative pathway of the complement system, right? So that consumes you C3 level. So that is one diagnostic uh, thing in Sri Lanka that we can use. Because how do exactly diagnose atypical HUS, you have to do genetic studies, right? So that is what you how you diagnose. Even in UK, for you to get your ge genetic study results, it takes about, uh, about almost three weeks, right? So you can't wait till three weeks for you to get the results, right? So that's why we have to like come up with a quicker method of treatment before it's too late, right? So once you have the TMA, you start with the plasma exchange, and then you get the Adam TS13. If the Adam TS13 is low, then you are happy. It is TTP, right? But if it is normal, then you are dealing with a case of atypical HUS, as in my patient, right? So then in the Europe, in UK, you have these two agents, which block the terminal complement pathway. So that is the eculizumab and the uh, ravalucimab, right? So the eculizumab was the, uh, the previous uh, agent. Uh, this needs to be dosed weekly. And uh, the same company, Alexiol, has come up with this Revolucimab, uh, which you can dose in a monthly basis, right? But these uh, drugs are not available in Sri Lanka. And one dose of this drug costs about 3,000 pounds. One dose is 3,000 pounds, right? So you just imagine the cost, right? And you have to give it in a weekly basis. So only for the atypical HUS who one patients, the NHS, authorize the issue of these drugs, right? For all others, uh, because it's prohibitively expensive even for the developed country, right? So in Sri Lanka, the problem is we never, we don't have these drugs, right? And nobody can afford this, right? So only option for us is to go with the plasma exchanges, right? So there was observational study uh, to uh, 73 patients uh, with the presumed diagnosis of this atypical HUS uh, over half of the patients had improvement with the plasma exchange. So this is the only treatment that is available in the country. And this doesn't uh, uh, differ, like you are in Colombo, in Polonaru, or anywhere. This is the only treatment you have in the country, right? And uh, so how does a therapeutic plasma exchange work in our patient with atypical HUS? So it is postulated that the, the, the TPE, we are doing it with FFP, right? So we are taking FFP from normal donors, right? So they will be having this uh, adequate amount of this inhibitor, right? Because they are having normal plasma, right? So when you give it that normal plasma with the adequate inhibitor to our patient, it kind of like, uh, I mean, gets rid of this deficiency that our patient is having, right? And also if the patient is having antibody, like uh, what we assumed in our patient, the antibody will get removed with the plasma exchange, right? And replaced with the, normal plasma which doesn't have the antibody, right? So that is how the TPE works in our uh, atypical HUS. So this is a picture uh, of the, the blood bank team, right? Uh, so they, uh, this patient was with them uh, for more than one year, actually, right? We made the diagnosis, 
but uh, the blood bank team was the one who kind of uh, continued with the treatment. So the lady in the uh, yellow blouse is the patient. Right, so this is uh, we we took this picture at the end of the treatment, like uh, after we stopped TP. So the, all those are the blood bank doctors, right? And uh, this is a big shout out to our madam, uh, our blood bank consultant, madam Dharma, madam uh, at the uh, Teaching Hospital Candy. So she was uh, so good. I mean, like uh, she, I mean, uh, listened to our request to give fifty five plus exchanges uh, for a single patient. Right, so this was a, I mean, a very good endeavor. We saved this patient, and uh, she is now uh, living a good life, and she is now a uh, practicing nurse in the country. Right, uh, this is the biopsy I was telling about. This was misdiagnosed as uh, leptospirosis. So this patient present with a low, uh, low platelet count with AKI, and uh, they thought it is lepto, right? And uh, they didn't do much for the patient, and later the renal function didn't improve. So they have done a renal biopsy. And again, this shows the same changes. Uh, the small arteries and arterioles showing myxoid intimal proliferation with red cell fragmentation. And also the same feature of the thrombosis with the fibrinoid necrosis of the small blood vessels. So here, the diagnosis of uh, Professor, Madam, uh, Professor uh, which, uh, uh, Sulochana Madam has made the proper diagnosis in this patient. So that is, uh, she had correctly given appearance are those of a thrombotic microangiopathy with severe vascular impairment and glomerular ischemia, right? So I think, yeah, that's about it. Uh, I don't know whether it was uh, too much, uh, like uh, hopefully you learned something from that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Maitri, for a very interesting and very informative <coughs> presentation. Uh, that's a very rare presentation, very rare case, and uh, uh, we learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you once again, Dr. Maitri. And yeah, now we are coming... You. Now, now we are coming to the uh, Q and A session, and uh, let me to check the Q and A box. <clears throat> uh, as uh, we have no questions received from the audience yet, uh, may I ask a question from <clears throat> Dr. Malin? Dr. Malin, uh, you 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 told. Uh, Basidiolomycosis, there are reported few cases in Sri Lanka. Yeah. So the, your case was a very rare and very interesting presentation. Do you have any idea what, what, what are those cases? Uh, yeah. yeah, regarding... Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear. Yeah, so one, uh, actually, the, that's why I mentioned it as a rare case of our, our patient, because uh, these, uh, the previous one or two patients one, uh, one is a child, both of them are in child, and one is adolescent. One case regarding uh, uh, intestinal uh, basidiobolus mycosis and had the abdominal pain and uh, go ahead with the surgery and found to have a fungal ball. The other case uh, around subcutaneous, in, uh, it's at the uh, uh, extremity, extremity. Yeah. So both cases, I think uh, Dr. Primarija was involved and uh, she has uh, published uh, both uh, cases as well and her uh, uh, juniors, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malin. Also, we got one question, we see. Uh, uh, this question goes, goes to Dr. Maitri. Dr. Maitri, this, uh, this, uh, this question in the Q&A box from Dr. Randika. And the question is pulmonary hemorrhages is, is it uh, common with TMA? Uh, yes, uh, pulmonary hemorrhages uh, is not common with TMA. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, now we were at loss, right? Uh, what's happening in our patient. So we did extensive literature research and uh, we went through many case reports. And uh, what we found out was with uh, this uh, uh, complement mediated TMA, that is the atypical HUS, and also with uh, the catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, it is very well documented, uh, pulmonary hemorrhages uh, uh, in those two conditions. But uh, it is not common in the other TMAs, like uh, TTP, uh, your uh, Shigella toxin uh, HUS, the diarrhea positive HUS, that's not common. And also in the other TMAs that I were talking about, like hypertensive TMAs and all that, it's kind of uncommon. But uh, you should think of uh, if there's a TMA with pulmonary hemorrhages, 
uh, you should think of these two conditions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maitri. And yeah. uh, yes. Now, uh, in the absence of more questions, any more questions, let me to wind up the sessions today. First, I would like to thank two speakers, Dr. Malin Uppala Dahanayaka and Dr. Maitri Fernando for ac accepting our, uh, our invitations to share their experiences with us. Also, I would like to thank CCP staff, audiovisual team, Mr. Nalina and team, uh, and sponsor Merck Pharmaceuticals for their continuous support and all virtual participants who are joining with us today. Thank you.